Thanks. I'm Eric Suzanne, and uh, which you know. Uh, so welcome to uh, Zurich Front End Conference. How many of you are from Zurich? A good chunk. How many of you other places in Europe? All right. Farther? Nice. Where from? Argentina. Wow, great. All right. Uh, I'm from the States, uh, Denver, Colorado. So it's really nice to be here. This is a beautiful city. Thanks for having me here. Um, so just a quick, too long, didn't read of what we're going to talk about tonight, uh, this morning. Uh, <laughs> we're all solving similar problems. Uh, we all have unique constraints. And we can work together uh, to uh, address both of those. Uh, be able to take care of our own constraints uh, while also sharing code that solves similar problems. So, uh, like Steve said, uh, I created Suzy, which was an attempt to do this, and I got really lucky. Now it's been used on some sites that are cooler than I am, so that's nice. Um, but back in 2008, when I was getting started, uh, things were different. I didn't have any programming skills. I was a theater major dropout, uh, working as a designer, uh, running a theater company, uh, no idea what programming was. I built my first website in order to have a site for my theater company. I didn't have any original ideas with Suzy. Um, it's completely based on the work of Natalie Down, who I finally met last year, which is awesome. I didn't have a plan. Uh, I was actually just trying to make some grids. Um, and there's nothing special about grids to me. I don't believe in grids somehow. They're not. Uh, they're not magic, they're not going to save your website. Um, but I was making grids and it was painful trying to make grids that were responsive. Um, and somebody pointed me at SAS and said, uh, there might be a better way to do this. I didn't have open source experience, I didn't have a GitHub account, I didn't really know what open source was, I had a vague idea in theory, uh, but I had never done it. I mean, I wasn't a programmer, so why would I? Uh, I had I just checked. I went to the Wayback Machine on Google. I had 35 followers. Uh, well, 37 a month earlier, so I'm not sure what happened. Uh, but yeah, I was only lurking on the websites. Um, no badges. I don't think we had badges back then. I don't know. Um, but I certainly didn't have any badges. Uh, this was Oddbird. Uh, Oddbird is me and my brothers uh, and a few other staff now. Uh, this is us. I think doing our first planning for a site, I think we're playing Magic the Gathering there in 94. Um, so that's the formation of Oddbird, our first meeting maybe. Uh, and back then we used CSS. I don't know if any of you remember CSS. Do any of you write CSS? Yeah, a few? No, nobody? Um, it looked like this uh, back in the day, I don't know. Um, this is not a real use case. Uh, but this is a lot of the hacks that we were using uh, just to get a basic layout um, back in the early days of the web. Uh, and then along came uh, 960 and Blueprint, and we finally had some sharing of open source front end styling tools, uh, both of these for layout, both grid systems. Uh, but the code that they used wasn't my code. It was, I had to use their classes uh, in my markup and structure my markup to match their classes. Uh, it wasn't my design. I didn't have any say over the grid. Uh, they gave me this grid and then I could use it or not. Um, but I didn't have any say. And I found that this often, they would sell this as uh, rapid prototyping. You can very quickly put together a site, move things around, and what I found was that I was rapidly backed into a corner. Uh, I, would, I could move things around very quickly, but then as soon as I had to go uh, do something slightly different from what they wanted, uh, I was on my own. And I had to fight the system in order to uh, build my own site. So I wanted something a little different than that. Uh, I think the tools shouldn't work that way. The tools should fit you. You don't have a special hammer for building one thing and another special hammer for building something else, you've got a hammer and you can hit whatever the fuck you want with it. So that's what I wanted was a, a tool that I could 
build anything with. Um, all of these, uh, we're dealing with similar layout problems. Uh, what is the container uh, of the layout? What, is, what are columns in the grid? What are gutters in the grid? Uh, how do padding and margins work? How do I move things around on the grid? Uh, so there's a lot of similar problems that all these tools were solving. And then there were some unique layout constraints that I might have when building my site. Uh, whether sometimes I wanted to use float or sometimes inline block or sometimes now flexbox. Uh, these all work in different ways, so maybe I want to switch between them for different cases. Uh, and these grid systems couldn't handle that sort of switching. There was one way and you could just do that. So uh, around that time, I saw this talk, which I did not see live. Uh, this was in 2008, Natalie Down gave this talk in London. I wasn't there. I happened to link to it online and read through her slides and thought this was brilliant. Uh, she proposed CSS systems. Her idea behind CSS systems was that instead of frameworks uh, that give you the one set of code that you just use again and again and again, uh, that's exactly the same, instead you would design a system where you knew how you were gonna write your code uh, and it would be similar across all your projects and you would use the same basic techniques, uh, but you'd be able to customize. Uh, and she went into a lot of detail. You can still find this talk online, it's a great talk. Uh, and the basics of it is this one math problem. I'd say algorithm, but that's a little strong. Uh, target divided by context equals multiplier. And if you've ever done fluid layouts, you've done this math. Uh, in order to get the percentage width of something, uh, you say, uh, this is the target number of columns that I want. This is the uh, context, how many columns I have available. And if I divide those, I get the percentage that I need. And that's everything you do for responsive layouts. And I was doing this over and over again. So every five minutes as I was coding, those days I had a calculator beside my keyboard and I would just punch in the numbers and then copy in the code. And this is what the code would look like if I could show my math, uh, but I couldn't show my math. Um, oh, I don't have a slide of that. I couldn't show my math, so what I had uh, in the code was just the numbers and no explanation of what those numbers meant. Uh, you had no idea when you saw 25.375, what does that represent? Um, what is that supposed to do on the grid? So I was complaining about that uh, to my older brother. We were just starting to work together at the time, uh, and he's a Python developer. And he said, well, maybe there's some tool we can use uh, to do that math for you. Have you seen this Compass thing? At that point, uh, Compass was just starting to get popular. Chris Epstein had just released an hour-long tutorial video uh, that nobody watched the whole way through. Um, uh, but it, was, it seemed like a really cool thing. Uh, SAS had been around a couple of years, but nobody was, it wasn't getting that much traction. Um, but I watched some of the Compass video. We actually uh, tweeted to Chris to get a lot of help setting it up. And uh, the first day I was playing with it, I wrote just a couple lines of code that just did that one math problem. And uh, my brother said, uh, this is open source code that you wrote. Somebody else might want this. And I said, why? And he said, I don't know, but they might. Uh, so he put it on GitHub. You can see the initial commit is from him. I didn't have an account at the time. So he set that up. And then uh, we together made me an account and transferred it over. Uh, and I had to start using GitHub. Uh, have any of you seen this original syntax of SAS? Uh, it's crazy and we've come a long way. Um, so the original docs looked like this. It was just an example of how you might use Suzy. And you know, the big advantage in my mind was uh, you can just say grid columns three and now you have meaningful code. It says exactly what it is. If you're reading that, you know what I was trying to do and that will output the 12.375. And then you can prefix um, and you can do other things. But this is terrible. It looks like this if you put it together. So it's not a great example of how you might use Suzy. Um, nothing lines up. It's not 
in any way a real use case. So Chris Epstein wrote back to me and said, is this really what this is supposed to do? It looks terrible. Uh, and I said, no. How do you write docs? So, oh. Uh, we've come a long ways. Uh, Susie now can, uh, with one set of code and then changing the variables, uh, you can get any number of different, uh, well, oh, this is the first one. Um, this, uh, this layout is something that Natalie Down uses to test grid systems to see if they can do complex nesting. So this was the first thing that I made sure Susie could do. Uh, and in the original one, it was very opinionated. I used Natalie Down's system, which was a, uh, a container sized with M's, so it was uh, flexible to your font size, and then everything inside was built uh, using um, percentages, so it was fluid to the container. Uh, and that meant you could very quickly uh, change the size of the container and you'd have a different, uh, the, the grid would uh, resize to match. So that was really useful. This was before media queries. This was sort of an early version of doing responsive design. It would flex down at larger, uh, smaller window sizes and it would flex up if you bumped up the font size. Um, but Susie was very opinionated. It just did this one thing. And then a lot of people started telling me what I had done wrong and how they wanted to use it differently. Uh, and uh, we very quickly changed the way things worked and started uh, fleshing it out. Now it looks more like this. It's more of a grid system system. Uh, it can do various different layout types. Uh, it's really just that one calculator at the core. And uh, from there you can say, well, I want to use floats and I want to use float isolation and uh, you can push things around. And you have a lot of control. Um, you don't just have to do the one thing. And then we tried to make it so that uh, you have access to all of the core functions and you can build your own grid system out of that. And so now uh, that same code that gave us that first layout can give us totally different layouts. This one uses padding for the gutters instead of margins. Uh, this one, the gutters don't change size as you resize. Uh, here, everything is static widths and uh, we're using margins but split margins. Um, so you can just change and do all sorts of things. And that all came from users giving me feedback and saying, uh, you know, I need to do something different. And uh, the realization to me was uh, they're the experts of their own code. I don't know better than they do what they should do for their layout. Uh, so I took their advice and tried to make it more flexible and figure out what exactly is special uh, that's useful to Susie uh, across all of these layouts instead of just mine. So uh, with functions now, I can say span three of 12 and I can put that in the width. I could put that in a margin. I could use that for Flexbox. Uh, so those functions give us more flexibility and more power to let you do whatever you want. So to me, that's the coolest thing about SAS is being able to abstract to that level where you have all of the control and I'm only solving the one problem for you. So toolkits are a byproduct. Susie came out of just me trying to make my code more dry. I didn't want to keep repeating that math problem. I wanted to make it more readable. Um, I was working on something else. The toolkit didn't come first. The cool toolkit is just sort of the waste material of uh, building websites. Um, I built the websites and then Susie is what I ended up with uh, and shared. So that's how I think about making any toolkit is start by looking for patterns that you're repeating over and over and what is the core of that pattern. What are the unique constraints also? So what's shared in the pattern and then what is different uh, in each instance of a pattern? Um, Uh, so one of the uh, things with that is there's lots of open source tools. So uh, if, uh, if I'm going to use somebody else's tool, maybe they haven't 
uh, considered my unique constraints, and I'm going to need to make changes. And early on, this was this was a thing with Susie. It wasn't very helpful to me when people just forked the code and went off on their own and did their own thing. But when people then came back and showed that to me, uh, that was really useful, and we were able to then continue sharing what was the core, even though uh, we were all making slight adjustments to take care of our own unique constraints. So um, a great way to be part of this community is to both use open source tools and fork them, change them, and then send that back to the community because other people may share your unique constraints. Systems are better than solutions for that. Uh, when I'm building a toolkit, I want something that uh, gives me an approach, uh, a way to take care of my problems. Again, I want a hammer uh, that I can hit anything with uh, rather than a prefab kit that I snap together um, because then I don't have any control. I don't get to build my website. So find the core of your toolkit. Uh, this was in SUSE, the core is this. Um, I can define what a gutter is and what a column is, and uh, I can call SUSE to do the math. Um, and then if I want fluid math, I get a percentage, and if I want static math, I multiply by a width. Um, and that's the core of SUSE. That's what it is. And so th we've released this as an open source tool as well. If you want to completely build your own grid system, that's there. Uh, this is another toolkit that I was playing with at one point that sort of represents how I go about it. So I was doing these CSS only tabs several different places. Uh, and what I realized, this was sort of the first draft. Uh, the container wraps all the tabs. Um, container stays uh, equal height no matter what tab you're on. It f goes to the, the size of all the content. Um, there's no JavaScript height calculations. There's no JavaScript in the interaction. Um, it's all responsive. So I thought that was pretty cool, so I made a little plug-in for it. Um, and it looked something like this. It was kind of crazy, and it had way too many little finicky things that you had to fill in. Uh, and once I started playing with it, I realized that uh, accordions used pretty much the same code, and uh, there were there were a bunch of other patterns that looked very different uh, that used the same core, and this was what was essential. This was the core of it. Uh, it was just using an input to toggle something, and that was it. Uh, and very quickly, I ditched the entire rest of the thing, and now this is what I have uh, available in my toolkit because this is the this is the essential shared solution between all these patterns, and uh, everything else was unique to the site. So trimming it down to just what's essential is really helpful in building your toolkit. Once you have a toolkit, uh, and I have various small toolkits that I use differently for different projects, and I break them all out, uh, and then I pull in on a project just the, just the pieces of the toolkit that I need, uh, once you have it, if you want to share, if you want to be part of the community, uh, and the great thing about being part of the community is other people will help you fix your code, which is great. It's like getting a whole QA team uh, without paying them. Um, so uh, I recommend sharing on GitHub, but that's not because anything special about GitHub. That's just because that's where the people are. Uh, so if where the people are changes, go somewhere else, follow the people. Uh, they're what's important about that. GitHub is just good for the community, and the community is what you're looking for. Add a README, that's really helpful for other people getting started. Uh, and if you don't have any other documentation, a README is a great place to just give people an introduction, uh, make sure they know what the thing is and how they can start using it, and uh, do better than I did on writing an example. But, you know, again, you're part of a community, you can write a shitty example the first time, and other people will help you fix that. Uh, it's a good idea to choose a license. Um, so I don't know exactly how it works in different countries. In the US, you automatically have full copyright whenever you create something. Uh, a license just documents uh, for other people exactly how they are allowed to use it. Um, without a license, they're not allowed to use it. Uh, and so a lot of people, especially in larger companies, won't be able to use it if you don't give a license 
the license actually is what allows other people to have it. Um, BSD and MIT are mostly what I use, but that's because that's what my community uses. So uh, those are the most common in the SAS community. So I use the most common in the SAS community. Uh, Jacob Kaplan Moss does a great talk, uh, more detail on licenses. But uh, the, the core is uh, look at what you're wanting to share, look at what the licenses do, and uh, lean towards what your community uses. This is what a license looks like. It's all pretty simple. You can copy and paste it from somewhere else. Uh, I didn't go searching for this somewhere. I just uh, was looking at the Compass project. They had this license, copy, paste, put my name in it. Make sure you put your own name in it. Um, another thing to do that helps the community uh, is to add semantic versioning uh, with tags on GitHub. That just helps other people know when you've done minor updates, major updates. And all of this uh, shouldn't stop you from doing the first release, uh, not having any idea what you're doing. Um, you know, it was uh, four years into SUSE before we had semantic versioning and tags. Um, but we, we slowly got there and people slowly requested it. Uh, so you can get started right away, but then, you know, work towards uh, consistency. I also have some toolkits that I share, uh, but they're not just for you to use. So I don't, I don't version them. I don't care if you, uh, if it breaks for you. I'm not maintaining it for you. And I just say that clearly in the readme. This is for me, and I might do backwards breaking things, but I want it to be available uh, so you can look at it. You can pull what you want from it. Um, but don't trust me uh, unless I tell you to. Um, anything you document doesn't exist. This was a uh, problem we had early on in SUSE. Uh, I mostly documented the quick and easy ways to get started. And then it turned out people were only using the quick and easy ways to get started. Uh, they weren't using any of the powerful functionality underneath that I thought was more interesting. And so I've been really trying to uh, document the quick and easy start less and document the powerful functions more because that's what I think is cool and what I think you should use. So nobody's going to dig into the code, or very few people are going to dig into the code. Um, so it's uh, whatever you want people to know about your toolkit is what you need to document. Uh, SAS doc is a new thing. Is Hugo here? Hugo is talking, I think, later today. Um, uh, worth seeing. Uh, Hugo created SAS doc, and it's a quick way to do documentation uh, in your SAS code and then build out a site. Uh, the site that you get looks like this by default. It has lots of customization, um, so you can get documents uh, looking the way you want, um, but it's a great way to just quickly document your SAS code and get uh, some helpful docs right away. Um, package and distribute, again, this is going where the people are. So early on when I was making SUSE, that meant uh, most SAS users were using Compass and SAS was completely in Ruby. Um, so that meant creating Ruby gems uh, that were compatible Compass plugins. So that's what I did early on. Now a lot of that is moving to Node, so creating Node packages is often the way to go. Uh, also Bower packages. So now there's sort of a fragmenting of where the people are, uh, but uh, you can find your community and go wherever the people are to package your toolkit. Uh, this is, uh, I don't know how they pronounce it, Sash, Sachet, I don't know. Um, but this is a, a cool website where you can um, tell them that your toolkit exists and is available. Uh, and they document uh, all of the available SAS toolkits and plugins. And you can search them and look for uh, the kind of tools that you need. And then all of these are on GitHub. So you can go find the original code. You can fork it. You can make changes. Um, this is a great tool for the community, uh, all, of the, uh, all of the community extensions. So for Ruby SAS, like I said, uh, Ruby Gems, uh, Compass, Bower, you can use all that for Ruby SAS. With Lib SAS now, uh, iGlass is coming out 
Um, I think it's already out in beta, and it's sort of the new compass for LibSAS. Uh, it doesn't have any of the CSS3 stuff that Compass was bloated with, um, but it does a lot of cool file management um, and some nice helping. Uh, otherwise, NPM and Bower. Uh, and Eyeglass is built in NPM, so uh, those work together. And for a lot of this, you can just copy and paste. There's a lot of, uh, you know, a, a Bower package and an NPM package look very similar, and you can copy and paste them from other projects and update the content. Uh, and you're good to go. That's what I did. I don't understand half this code, uh, but copy it in there, um, update the things that look unique, and uh, it usually works. And then you can ask people if it doesn't. So uh, for Sash, it looks like this. They're all in JSON mostly, um, just a name and a description and some tags, and that's pretty similar to Bower, uh, a name and then a path and a description and author and things like that. Um, Package.json, again, looks very similar. Uh, and so you can just put all of those in your uh, repo and you're ready to share. I really recommend launching softly. I've seen a lot of projects sort of do big marketing campaigns and a big launch and then something goes wrong and everybody sees it go wrong all at the same time and then nobody uses that project ever again. Uh, and I was really lucky. Susie didn't become popular until like year four, which really surprised me because <laughs> I was just sort of using it and then four years later it was a thing. Um, but it, it worked nicely. Like if people had looked at Susie when I first launched it, uh, it would have died a quick death because um, it was terrible. So uh, launch what you have, get a few people looking at it, uh, get a little feedback, make updates, uh, let it grow slowly. And as for feedback, uh, you can tweet to me if you want. Uh, there's a lot of other people who are now way more active in the SaaS community than I am. Uh, Hugo is a great example. Um, but the community is very friendly and all on Twitter. Uh, I was really lucky getting started. Chris Epstein helped me with everything. And then uh, Natalie was uh, available to help. And uh, they still are. If you have questions, they write SAS. I mean, they write the language, and uh, they'll help you with anything. So feel free to ask people. Uh, once you get into it, maintaining a change log is really helpful, uh, just so that people know from one release to the next what changed, what they need to be looking for, if anything uh, might be backwards incompatible. That's just really helpful. Facilitating community. The, the thing that I loved about Compass early on and about SAS, the reason I jumped on the SAS bandwagon right from the start uh, was because I, the way Chris and Natalie talked about building a community, and they've done a great job of that. Uh, early on, Les was starting to get more attention, um, but the way those two think about uh, their code and how they're going to build a community Everything they do is about making, uh, making it so that we can all use SAS and we can all share SAS and it will work everywhere. Um, so building a community is a huge part of it. And uh, you can on GitHub, if you do a contributing.md, uh, it will give this little notice anytime somebody is commenting or forking or making a pull request. And you can just give some guidelines. And again, sort of similar to having a license, uh, these guidelines are helpful for people who want to get involved and don't know how you can give them a structure for getting involved and being part of your community. So these sorts of things look from the outside a bit like uh, they might push people away, but they're really useful for actually giving people the structure so they know how to get involved. And give credit. This seems obvious to me. Uh, why would you not give credit? Um, my, my work is completely based on Natalie Down and Chris Epstein and Natalie Weisenbaum and uh, a number of other people, Eric Meyer, uh, the whole list. Um, if you're using other people's code, thank them. Uh, responding to issues can be a real pain in the ass if you're maintaining uh, open source software, but uh, the goal 
is to respond quickly and kindly. Uh, there can be times when the main, uh, the main maintenance I'm doing on Suzy is teaching people how to use CSS, and that can be frustrating, but that's fine. Uh, and my fr they don't know that I've been asked the same question 20 times. There's no reason to be upset with them, uh, and there's no reason to be uh, rude on GitHub. So uh, trying to be kind, trying to respond quickly, even if that response is, hey, I don't have time for this right now. I'll get back to you in a month. Um, you don't want to get overwhelmed by open source guilt. It happens. Uh, but. You're not responsible for other people's code, but try to be uh, friendly and responsive. Test your logic. Susie didn't have tests again for the first four years or something, but uh, eventually we were big enough that we had to start adding tests. So we created True, which is the SAS testing framework. There are several other frameworks out there that you can use. Um, True just, uh, I based it off of a JavaScript testing framework. Uh, you can define tests, you can have assertions. Um, mostly it works best on functions, testing functions. Uh, it does now have some ways to test most mix-ins. There are still a, a few things it can't do. It's written entirely in SAS, so it's sort of limited to what SAS can do. Uh, it does now have a Mocha extension, so if you use uh, Mocha, uh, you can run your SAS tests with Mocha. Uh, and it should be able to plug into other test run, test running frameworks. Um, and then the results look like this. Uh, that also ties in with something like Travis CI. Uh, any integration, any test integration uh, tools that you're using, Travis or Circle CI or something like that, uh, you can have them run your SAS tests. And it gives you this sort of thing on GitHub so you know that uh, your SAS isn't gonna break when you merge. Go make shit up. That's really it. Um, it's, it's a lot of fun to make toolkits, I think. Start by drying your code. Uh, find where you're repeating yourself. And then uh, once you have uh, something abstracted out, uh, abstract it down to just the core and make it extensible so that um, you can use it in as many places as possible and then share it with people because we're all solving the same problems and we might as well do it together. Uh, you can find a few of my tools, uh, Oddbird, uh, Accoutrement. We have various accoutrement for different things, uh, maps, color, scale, uh, various things that we just use consistently across our sites. And you can find these links, you can find uh, this talk online and all these links. Thank you. Um, we're pretty early, so we're going to have like a cup of tea. No. <laughs> um, do we have any questions in the audience for Eric? Anything at all? If you don't do it, I'm going to do it. No one? All right, I'm going to do it. Um, I'm going to be the, the devil's advocate who yeah. uh, is going to ask you about all these dependencies that we get in our whole workflow. So, Used to be we'd write some CSS, right? Yeah. And now uh, we wanted to make it easier. We added SAS. Uh, so you have to add, um, you know, you have to have Ruby. You have to know how to install some gems, which isn't that hard, but still. So you use Auto Prefixer. Uh, you use Suzy. Um, way back when we had to have Compass for Suzy, and depending on which uh, Compass and which SAS you had. Uh, or which Suzy that determined which SAS you had to have and that kind of thing. So suddenly these workflows get a lot harder. Anyone here experience like workflows that are getting increasingly hard and then you forgot, or you didn't document well because no one documents well, right? <laughs> which was an important thing that you mentioned. Um, how do you feel about that as a toolkit? Uh, what are your thoughts on that as a toolkit builder? Uh, I think it's always a trade-off. Um, so. Uh, it's, it's just a matter of what's going to help your team uh, get the work done easier and faster uh, and with less, with less bugs, right? So uh, one of the main advantages to shared code is that you've got shared 
debugging of the code. Uh, and that can be huge. Um, so uh, that's helpful. And then, but then you maybe do have more dependencies. Um, I, it is a trade-off. And I, I feel like we make this decision differently uh, for each dependency that we look at uh, on our team. Um, so sometimes we'll say, okay, for this piece of code, it's really worth it. And for this piece of code, it's not helping. Uh, we could do better on our own. Uh, I think the, the goal is to both not get too dependent on other people fixing everything for you. Um, if you are going to be using other people's code, it's best to have some understanding of it uh, and be able to contribute to that community, to be able to go back and say, okay, we, we found this bug, uh, we can help fix it, or at least uh, we found it, can you help fix it, we'll help you test. Um, so being part of the community really helps if you are using other people's code. Um, but sometimes you've got to write your own, but you don't want to also fall into the trap of uh, not invented here, believing that everything has to be custom to your own site. You'll just uh, keep reinventing the wheel. Okay, so you mentioned uh, building these toolkits. A lot of the toolkits come into being not because someone decides I want to make a toolkit for everyone, but um, I want to make my project easier or right. solve a problem that I'm having, and I just want to be able to share this. Uh, I think a lot of toolkits are like that. Yeah. And what, what happens is that people invest a lot of time learning these toolkits, uh, which means that to get that time investment back, uh, we now want to use those toolkits for every single project, right? Right. <laughs> so we kind of lock ourselves in uh, to these toolkits. Would you, would you agree with that? Yeah, I think that happens a lot. Um, I would, I would recommend never trusting the toolkit over your own sense of what's most useful. I don't use Suzy on everything. Um, it was funny, I did a, a podcast recently where somebody said, you know what, where did you use Suzy last? And I was like, oh, was three years ago. Because uh, the site I'm working on now doesn't need it. Uh, I just don't need grids. Um, and if I don't need grids, why would I use Suzy? And at first I did. Uh, the first, you know, I put Susie in and I started working and I was like, I don't, I've got two columns. I don't need grids for this. It's, there's not a thing. Uh, so pull it out. Um, don't, there's, there's no reason that you should trust the toolkit over what your site needs. You mentioned uh, documentation. I'm curious how I've seen the documentation of Susie grow and get better uh, through the years from basically <laughs> like a couple lines and a tutorial to, uh, you know, where you actually learned more from the tutorial than the documentation. Right, yeah, yeah. And now it's, uh, it's pretty decent documentation. Uh, have you noticed uh, your support going down as a result of having better documentation, the, the, the questions you have to answer? Yeah, uh, some, but really it's that the user, that I get more users uh, because they go to the documentation first. It seems like the support kind of stays steady while the user base goes up. So it's a smaller percentage, um, but uh, that balances out. There's a lot of people who ask me questions that are on the first page of the docs, and then it's just clear that they haven't even bothered to look. But well, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good answer. We have a question back there, yes. Yeah, sorry. Uh, as an author who writes a library for SAS, how hard is it to keep up with the differences of libsas and Ruby says, especially with your internal logic that is quite complex and uses a lot of maps and and yeah. Well, so uh, for those of you who don't know, SAS started on Ruby, uh, and it was Ruby only. And recently, libsas came out, which was a C port uh, and can be used uh, in various ways. Uh, the most common is Node SAS, uh, which is you know, a wrapper for LibSAS. I don't know oh, all the stacks, um, but so so LibSAS came out and it has slightly different functionality. It didn't have all the features. They were working towards feature parity. Uh, Ruby SAS is the canonical original, uh, and LibSAS is still catching up. Um, mainly, what I did was I went through and documented all of the bugs on LibSAS that Susie ran into. And they fixed them in a week. 
Um, so that's how I dealt with it. Uh, I, I sort of waited until I thought it roughly should work, uh, and it didn't. And I found workarounds that let me see more and more of the bugs. Uh, but I didn't release Susie with the workarounds. I just documented all the bugs. And uh, Michael, who seems to be one of the lead developers there, fixed them all. Um, so that's the best way to do it, as far as I'm concerned. And right now, now they're very close. Um, and in the future, so Ruby SAS has actually stopped development until LibSAS catches up. Uh, that's why there hasn't been any Ruby SAS development for the last little while. Um, and as soon as they're caught up, they're going to start releasing together, and there should be very few differences. Any other questions based on that? Okay, I saw quite a few people not raise their hand when I asked if they were familiar with Suzy. So I'm wondering yeah. if it's possible for you to give a little demonstration, or are you not set up in any way to do so? You <laughs> feel free to say no. Feel free to say no. Uh, it would it would take me a little bit to get uh, to get everything pulled together. Um, what if I say I would be happy to show anybody uh, afterwards uh, if anybody wants to see Susie? I'd be happy to show you. That sounds good. Okay. So thank you. Thank you, Eric Suzanne. <laughs>